And welcome to The Verdict. Kent Myers here uh, flying solo for, I believe, the last time uh, I'll be without Mick Cornett. He'll be back uh, soon. Uh, we're bringing a show to you today that uh, I've wanted to do since the uh, concept of vaping or e-cigarettes uh, developed for fairly recently. I wanted to do a show about the vaping and e-cigarettes, and I also wanted to do a show about the general state of health of our citizens here in Oklahoma, and I thought no better person to do that than to bring on, on our Commissioner of Health, uh, Dr. Terry Klein. So we're going to be visiting with Dr. Klein today about vaping, about e-cigarettes, and how that fits within the Oklahoma culture of smoking and non-smoking and what rules should apply to it. We're also going to be talking about other health problems that uh, stack up on Dr. Klein's death desk uh, from time to time and he has to deal with. I think you'll find this an interesting show. It will certainly affect all of our viewers because we're talking about your health today. You're watching The Verdict. I'll be right back. What I can offer is insight into understanding the Native American art, how these artists are expressing themselves as cultural people. I am Heather Ottone. I'm a Native American researcher and curator, and I am Chickasaw. I can remember in first grade the teacher saying, well, you're so lucky you don't look Indian. That was difficult to hear, because it was what I was, it's what I am. I think there's a renaissance going on amongst the tribes. I think the Chickasaws are leading that. We didn't die. We're not gone. So what are we now? And what can we do now to start to form that identity, to survive into another century? And to have the culture guiding us into that future, that would be significant. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at profilesofanation.com. It's a North American energy revolution. We're the fastest growing source of new oil and natural gas supplies in the world. The shift to North American energy will create approximately 3 million jobs. All that money we've been sending overseas, $400 billion a year. Imagine that staying in our economy. It's a game changer. Real energy independence starts now. And it starts with Oklahoma. Welcome back to The Verdict. Kent Myers uh, here with uh, Dr. Terry Klein, the uh, Commissioner of Health and the uh, Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services for the state of Oklahoma. Uh, Dr. Klein uh, is an Ardmore native. He uh, did his undergraduate work at the University of Oklahoma, did his master's and his PhD work in, psych in clinical psychology at Oklahoma State University. Uh, he has worked, uh, has a varied career in the health, health area. He has worked with the State Department overseas on, in some matters. Uh, he has taught at Harvard Medical School as an adjunct uh, professor. Uh, he has been appointed to a number of different positions in Oklahoma uh, by Oklahoma governors. He's been appointed to several different positions by two presidents. So he's uh, been active in the health area for a number of years. We were lucky enough to capture him and to get him in 2009 to, to stick in Oklahoma as our Commissioner of Health and Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, Dr. Terry Klein, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ken. It's a great pleasure to be here. Well, it's really good to have you. You're an Ardmore native. I am. An I grew up there. It was a fantastic place to grow up. I'm very grateful for my uh, upbringing in Ardmore. Uh, what pulled you into the psychology area where you have your PhD? I was, I was really just fascinated by the brain, you know, this organ that we carry around with us all my day wife, long. My wife has a master's in psychology. Oh, does she really? And she says she was fascinated by my brain <laughs> and what was wrong with it. But the, there, I mean, it really is this uh, uncharted frontier. We're learning so much about how the brain yeah. functions and how it works and, and what it does. So I just found that really, really interesting. Well, tell us a little bit about your organization. You are the Commissioner of Health and the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services. But what does that entail? What kind of an employee base do you have? What kind of an organization do you run? Sure. The Oklahoma State Department of Health actually has health departments across the entire state. 
we have uh, a budget that you know bumps up around four hundred million dollars. Wow. Uh, a couple of thousand employees that are spread across the entire state. Think about the work that we actually do. Uh, it's not nearly enough people, of course, yeah. right? And that's why we engage with a lot of communities. We have about sixty-nine county health departments spread across the state. Uh, almost every staffed county. by your employees. Staffed by our employees. And uh, those are the county health departments that you visit, um, you know, no matter what quadrant of the state that you're in. People doing incredible work, making sure kids are being immunized, making sure that we're limiting the spread of disease uh, as it emerges, catch it early, nip it in the bud. And a lot of work with communities about what communities can do uh, through coalition building, volunteerism, to actually improve the health status of people locally. So really looking for local solutions to local problems. Uh, Dr. Klein, I want to ask you what's a patently unfair question, uh, which I promised you I wouldn't do <laughs> off set. But uh, uh, Oklahoma, in a number of different categories, I couldn't uh, begin to name them all, gets pretty low grades for the health of our citizens. Uh, we have a very high smoking rate. We have a, a high teen pregnancy rate. We have a, a high uh, unwed mother rate. We have a high cancer rate, high heart disease rate. Uh, higher than many uh, other states. Why is it Oklahomans, by and large, just aren't uh, apparently not as healthy as other folks? That's a, that's a fantastic question. If you were to look at the United States and look at those states that are struggling the most with health outcomes, there's a very, very strong uh, correlation with poverty. Uh -huh. And um, uh, people who are impoverished basically have many more health challenges. Uh, education is often seen as the path uh, out of poverty, uh, so we need to do more around education as well. Uh, our tobacco rates have been very, very high in this state, and that's a significant driver of poor health outcomes. Heart disease, cancer, several of the things that yeah. you've mentioned. We've, uh, last year we were ranked 48th in the country in terms of tobacco use. The number one preventable cause of death in Oklahoma and the United States, you rank 49th, that's not good. Uh, and we are also ranked 48th in terms of cardiovascular disease mm -hmm. uh, death rates. Uh, this year, however, uh, our ranking actually improved to 39th. So we're making some in terms of our uh, tobacco use in the in the country. So we're making some progress on that, and it really has been through commu community coalition building, community saying, you know what, we're going to make sure that our schools are tobacco free. That's left up to the discretion of individual schools, uh, our communities. Uh, have been limited in terms of what they can do. There's actually a state law that prohibits communities from going smoke-free. One of only two states in the country that still have this outdated law on the books. Uh, but municipalities are saying they want their property to be smoke-free. A lot of businesses are voluntarily uh, doing that in other places as well. So we're making progress, but it's slow. Well, you have a uh, probably a, not an unusual mix, but we have a mix of urban and rural populations with the urban areas in Tulsa and Oklahoma City and, and some other smaller communities and then the rural area. Is there any d difference you can tell between the health of our urban citizens and the health of our rural citizens? Is one segment healthier than the other? You know, it's a very complicated question. I would say that it's more uh, widespread and yeah. more general in terms of those health outcomes. Again, if you look at poverty as being a key driver uh, we see a lot of poverty in the city as well in, as in rural areas. Um, what I always thought was kind of an interesting mix, you can look at the Health Sciences Center uh, here in mm -hmm. uh, Oklahoma City, and we have this incredible mix of fantastic services, health services, you know, the highest number of hospital beds and physicians and nurses and schools of pharmacy and dentistry and everything else. But in just within walking distance of all of that health care, we have the worst health outcomes in the entire state. So isn't that an interesting dilemma? Uh, infant mortality rates that are twice as high as the infant mortality rate just a couple of miles away, uh, higher uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes rates within walking distance of that health sciences center. Um, so it just it, it begs the question and makes us think, you know, public health is really more complicated than simply giving people access to health care. That's an yeah. important part, but it's not necessarily the most important part. It's not doing a preventative uh, service. Exactly. And, and our system really has been more of a, a sick care system mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than a health care system. Uh, one question I've been wanting to know the answer to is to whom do you report? 
you, you're the commissioner of health. Who's your boss? If so anybody? I wear multiple hats. Right. And uh, I was hired as the commissioner of health by a governing board. It's a nine-member board. And those uh, members are appointed by the governor for nine-year staggered terms. Good. That's a long term. Uh, so some of those individuals were uh, appointed by their what's previous a, uh, what's administration. It, called? Uh, it is the State Board of Health. State Board of Health, okay. Right. And then I'm appointed by the governor as the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So directly or indirectly, you report to the governor. I do. Yeah. Uh, and I'm also directly um, uh, accountable to that board. To the Board of right. Health, yeah. Um, discuss, let, let's change the topic now to what really is initially caught my eye about doing the show, and that's a concept of vaping, V-A-P-I-N-G, I think it is, or e-cigarettes. Uh, can you explain to our viewers what is your definition of vaping or e-cigarettes? Sure. With e-cigarettes, we have a liquid that actually uh, gets heated, uh, usually by a battery, and that creates a vapor that then gets inhaled by the user. Um, sometimes the e-cigarette uh, actually looks like a cigarette. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of those actually have little tips that light up. It serves no function other than it looks like a cigarette. Uh, and then we have now the uh, development of these tanks uh, where people can then vaporize that liquid uh, and then uh, take that into their bodies. Um, there, this is you know, a relatively new uh, phenomenon that yeah, we're seeing here. when did it first here. surface? Uh, just a few years ago. But what we're seeing is a CDC uh, has done a study in between... Center for Disease Control. Right, okay. Disease Control and Prevention. And what they found uh, between 2011 and 2012, almost a doubling of youth use of e-cigarettes. So 86.7% increase for high school students. Over what period of time? Between 2011 and 2012. My goodness. And, and an 83.3% increase for junior high students. So we're seeing a huge increase uh, in the utilization of e-cigarettes. And in Oklahoma, uh, we conducted a, a youth tobacco survey, and we included for the first time uh, a question about e-cigs. And what we found is that our rates are much higher than the nation, which maybe it's not surprising given that our tobacco rates are higher than a good uh, portion of the country. Uh, but it's about 7.8% of those surveyed uh, in, from high schools reported using e-cigs in the last 30 days. Uh, about 2.7% of junior high students reported using in the last 30 days. And when you ask the question, have you ever used an e-cig? 17.9% uh, of the high school students. So that's almost 20%. That'd be one out of every five in a high very school short students. Period of time. Huge. So that tells us there's huge uptake. Uh, we know that, and there are a lot of little mom and pop shops Yep. that are uh, kind of selling and making available e-cigs, and clearly these are getting in the hands of a lot of youth. And we have grave concern about that because this is really a new emerging area. It's not regulated or controlled in any way, so we don't have any guarantees about what is in that liquid. Uh, and we have a lot of people who are ingesting that into their systems, really taking it on faith uh, that it contains what they were told it contains. Well, in, in the last couple of decades, we've taken great strides in uh, limiting smoking by uh, acts of the legislature and the tobacco settlement and other uh, proactive uh, activities in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, are any of those rules that apply to smoking, do they apply to vaping as well or not? There are no rules. For there are vaping. no rules. There are no rules. So your eight-year-old could walk in uh, hypothetically and purchase this product uh, and use it. There's absolutely no control around that at all. And you're right. I mean, we have worked very hard to bring down those rates of tobacco use. Again, the number one preventable cause of death. We want to bring those rates down. We're at a historic low in terms of the smoking prevalence rate in our state. Uh, but this, this field is completely unregulated. And um, actually, the tobacco companies are large owners of e-cig products. Uh -huh. uh, one brand in particular brags about owning 49% of the e-cig market. Uh, they're making already tens of millions of dollars per quarter on this product, and it's an almost $2 billion industry. Now. Uh, and tobacco has a big hold in there. Well, 
Let's, I want to come back to this after our break. We've got to get to a break right now. Uh, we are visiting with Dr. Terry Klein, the Commissioner of Health here in Oklahoma. We're now discussing vaping and e-cigs. We're going to talk about that and other health issues when we return. You're watching The Verdict. I'll be right back. When you have something important to communicate, it becomes clear that there's a lot of competition for your audience's attention. So how can your message stand out and actually resonate with your audience? Legal Graphics has the answers. The team at Legal Graphics will work with you to plan, design, and even test your presentation to ensure your message will be heard and remembered. Call Legal Graphics today to schedule an appointment. The readiness is all. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. That's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. Welcome back, uh, Kent Myers on The Verdict. We're uh, visiting with Dr. Terry Klein, the Commissioner of Health in Oklahoma, talking right now uh, for the next couple of minutes about vaping or e-cigarettes in Oklahoma and the development of that uh, as a product uh, on sale uh, to almost anybody, I guess, here in Oklahoma. Um, have there been studies done, uh, credible scientific studies that uh, you're aware of to determine whether or not vaping is harmful? There, again, this is kind of an emerging science, so yeah. we're really at the forefront of this. And right now, the uh, research is mixed. And what, we're, what we do know is that the vapor that is emitted, uh, there was a myth that it was just water vapor. That's absolutely not true. It does contain a lot of other chemicals. Uh, that Can you are, just again, name being, a few of the chemicals that are likely uh, in Propylene the... glycol, which is actually used uh, like an, almost an antifreeze. Yeah. Uh, nicotine. Uh, which is uh, addictive uh, and very harmful to developing brains. So our cautionary note is not to use e-cigs around kids, not to use e-cigs around pregnant women. Uh, try not to use those in enclosed spaces because of the concern around exposure uh, in that vapor. Is secondhand vapor uh, exposure at least similar to the secondhand smoke exposure? Well, we don't really know the full impact uh, at this point. What we do know is uh, if you've seen anybody uh, vaping, uh, it is a cloud, basically, yeah. of yeah. that vapor. Uh, and there are some studies that show that the nicotine uptake for a bystander is just as great uh, as it would be for a cigarette. Um, and that's not good. You know, people need to be aware that they're uh, potentially exposing people to those chemicals. Uh, did I see something recently that Governor Fallon had entered an executive order uh, applying some of the non-smoking area rules to vaping as well that, that already apply to cigarettes? Absolutely true, and I really would like to commend the governor for her leadership on this issue. Well, that was at your recommendation, was it not? The governor has a mind of her own, <laughs> I can absolutely tell you. And she has very strong feelings about uh, the health of Oklahomans. Mm -hmm. And um, in this particular issue, uh, the science is not conclusive. It's actually a little bit worrisome. We see hundreds of people and youth taking on this product. She's done what hundreds of private businesses have done in Oklahoma, and that is to ban the use of e-cigs on their property. So in this case, it's the state. So property that is owned or leased by the state, uh, there's a prohibition against the use of e-cigs on that property. Uh, for a lot of state services, you have pregnant women, kids, 
you know, going to get services there. Uh, so the concern about secondhand exposure is pretty great. So we've been able to limit it through that executive order. She signed a similar ban a couple of years ago around tobacco use on state property. So it really models that. But trust me, the governor has a mind of her own, uh, very uh, strong, independent, and concerned about the health of Oklahomans. Um, we were talking at the break a little bit about some potential legislative activity this session dealing with e-cigarettes. Can you just summarize that for us? Sure. Because of the large number of kids that we're seeing use these products, and again, the lack of science about these being safe, uh, there is proposed legislation this year that would prohibit the sale of e-cigarettes to youth. And almost everyone I've talked with, even people in the industry who are pushing e-cigs, say absolutely, there should be a, a prohibition uh, that would limit the sale. Uh, so that kids uh, can't get these in their hands. The concern is, so if you have a clean bill that moves forward doing that, is that you get other things kind of tagged onto that. Yep. Uh, one potential concern is uh, around giving e-cigs uh, advantageous tax benefits that keep the cost low. Uh, we've seen proposed legislation that would do that. Uh, it was introduced last year, but didn't pass. The smoking deterrence has been aided by increased in taxes on cigarettes, Absolutely. is it not? And anyone in the industry knows... There's a correlation to that. Right. If you want to decrease the use of a product, then you increase the price. And this um, is going the other way. This is going the other way, and it's really being pushed by the tobacco lobbyists who have a stake uh, in the sale of these products. Yeah. What uh, senators or legislators are you aware of that will be introducing uh, or likely to be introducing legislation? With the youth uh, prohibition, we mm -hmm. have uh, seen uh, Senator Simpson and Representative Ownby are pushing one bill uh, that would prohibit the sale to uh, youth, and there uh, are some other bills that are similar to that as well. And it really, uh, again, you have to commend the leadership on the part of uh, these legislators who are really bucking the tobacco lobbyists mm -hmm. and are saying, you know, we may not know all the science, uh, but we're not going to allow our kids to have access to this until we know it's safe for them. I am not a smoker, never have been a smoker, but I never remember seeing advertised cigarettes that were supposed to taste, and I'm looking down at my notes here, taste like root beer, marshmallow, sugar cookies, and the like. Uh, cigarettes were cigarettes. They tasted, I guess, like tobacco. Uh, but I understand now some of these vaping products uh, that are allegedly not aimed at children are selling with the flavors of root beer, marshmallows, sugar cookies, and the like. Why would they have those flavorings if they weren't going for a younger audience? I, I think it's a great question to ask. Now, I've had some adults say, well, we enjoy those flavors as well, but the reality well, is... Sure, I like sugar cookies as well as the next. Sure. I just don't want to smoke them. <laughs> I don't know if you remember. I remember the little candied cigarettes, cigars. Do you yeah. remember those? Oh, I do. Yeah, right. I do. I mean, how is, isn't that a great way to get kids, you know, kind of comfortable around that product. So we're seeing that here too in gummy bears and cotton yes. candy and yeah. bubble gum and there are over a hundred different flavors uh, that we know very, very clearly have appeal to kids. Yeah. Uh, and even if adults uh, are drawn to that, we know it has special appeal to kids. So we're concerned about that. What kind of reception uh, do you think the legislature will give to a legislation that takes a critical look at uh, e-cigarettes? I'm, I'm hoping it will be very receptive. Yeah. Uh, again, we have some champions. Uh, I'm convinced that the majority of our legislators are concerned about yeah. the health of their constituents. This bill focused specifically on prohibiting the sale to kids uh, should be at the top of every legislator's list. And now, just in the time we have available left uh, to visit with you, I want to talk about a few other areas besides vaping. The flu outbreak this year in Oklahoma and nationally. How did, what's your take on that? This, uh, we're, we've been kind of ramping into the flu season. A lot of people don't understand how serious the flu really is. Um, in Oklahoma, as of last Thursday, we put these data out on Thursdays, uh, we've had 975 hospitalizations wow. uh, since we you know, started with this season, which was at the end of September, and 33 deaths. That's a lot. I mean, this is actually costing like people's lives. Uh, we are going in, this is not the end of the flu season. Last year, we peaked really in March yeah. uh, for hospitalizations uh, connected to the flu. So I would encourage people to get their flu shots. Not too late. 
It's not too late. In the 30 seconds we have remaining, what can our viewers do to help you in your job, help your department? There's a very simple mantra, and if every person did this, we would improve the health of Oklahoma significantly. Eat better, move more, and be tobacco free. If you do those three things, and you're in charge of doing that, uh, put more color on your plate, fruits and vegetables, be more active, get up and just move around, and guarantee that you're tobacco free, uh, you can improve the lives of every single person in the state that takes that mantra to heart. Well, we are out of time, and we really do appreciate your time coming here today and doing the show Kat. for us. And thanks for the good work you do for our citizens. We do appreciate it. Uh, we're out of time now. I'm visiting with Dr. Terry Klein. I'll be back in just a couple of minutes. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. We are a very conservative family, and we believe in old-fashioned family values. We have a loving home there, and we love kids, and uh, we have five, six of our own. And uh, but I had no idea we were going to go into adoption, but we're, it's been very gratifying. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Welcome back. If you want to get a hold of Dr. Terry Klein, check his website. His website is www.ok.gov forward slash health. That will get you to Terry Klein, and you can uh, chat with him on his website. If you want our website, it's theverdict.tv. Let us know a uh, show you'd like to uh, see us do or a guest you'd like to see us have, and we'll see you next week. Thanks. <music>